Author Day of various authors reading aloud their work. We're going to start with Laura Lee Evans reading from Hi. 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 Okay. I wanted to make sure I pronounced it right. All right. Perfect. Um, so give yourself a little introduction for Indie Author Day. Hi. I am Laura Lee Evans. This is my book, Tig: A Flying Squirrel's Adventure, and um, I will be reading from it. Tig is a very smart squirrel. He's a flying squirrel and he uses his skills in this book to, for, to help himself out and to help his fellow characters out. I'll be reading from the first chapter. Tig Squirrel stepped back from his canvas and studied his unfinished painting. The brown, green, and blue tones of the tree and sky and background mixed well with the shadows and light but the ivory-billed woodpecker sitting on a branch in the center still had no face. Evening light filtered through the leaves around Tyg, and a gentle wind stirred the fur on his head. He sat on the branch of a cottonwood tree high off the ground. His left paw gripped his paint-covered palette, and his right held his paintbrush. The painting sat on an easel, waiting for him to continue. Tyg extended his brush toward the canvas, but pulled back again. Augustus's face stood out clearly in Tyg's mind, as if his old teacher perched beside him. He remembered every detail, but, why, but could he do the kind old woodpecker justice? And why was he so doubtful now? Tyg was a good painter, even though his parents had taken several of Tyg's paintings with them when they retired. He still had one, an image he had painted of his mom and dad, to remind himself that he could do this. He glanced at the half-open door where his branch met the tree trunk. The round wooden door led into a hollowed-out woodpecker's nest where Tyg had once lived with his parents, but they'd retired to a tree for old squirrels a few miles away in the town where the furless two-foots lived, or people, as his sparrow friends Felicity and Karen called them. His parents' new tree stood in a park behind several person houses, and Tyg loved to visit, to see his parents, of course, but also to watch people. He loved peering through the windows at the interesting paintings on the wall. Some were motionless, like his, but others changed in exciting ways. Sometimes these strange paintings hung there, dark and plain. Other times they would glow and show pictures that moved. Tyg could sit on the windowsills of person houses for hours watching these moving paintings and the exciting stories they told. The tiny paintings in his own home didn't move, but Tyg didn't mind. He could use his imagination. A good painting, Augustus had told Tyg, a smile curving the corners of his ivory colored beak, tells a story without words. It stirs imagination and helps folks wonder and think. Let your paintings tell stories. I will, Tyg said aloud like he had when he was a little squirrel speaking with Augustus but I've got to get your face finished. Tyke was a young squirrel, a flying squirrel with grayish brown fur on his back, creamy white fuzz in his tummy, round ears, and a little fluff of a tail. He also had a patagium on each side of his body. His two patagia, thick membranes of skin between his wrists and his ankles, helped him glide when he jumped from one tree to another. He wasn't using his patagia now, of course, as he sat in front of his unfinished painting, but he wasn't using his paintbrush either. Tyke stared at the blank spot. He wanted to be like Leonardo da Vinci from Italy, who painted the Mona Lisa, a smiling female person with a river and mountains in the distance behind her. Or like Francisco de Zerberan from Spain, whose painting showed a cup of water sitting on a plate. A pink rose rested beside the cup. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> everybody, I'm JC. Uh, I write Ben Regesh, Volume 1 of the Cocoon Chronicles. It's an action-packed, anime-inspired fantasy. And uh, here is an excerpt from it. I'll take the first watch, said Trina, taking a breath. I'll wake you up when it's your time. The only thing you'll be watching is the inside of your eyelids, said Tython. Here, eat this. Trina opened an eye to see the carcajou extending a piece of jerky in his furry paw. 
She took it with a word of thanks and tore off a chunk. The meat was tough, as expected, but nicely smoky and a little spicy. So, said Tyson, what's your story? My story? said Trina. Yeah, it ain't every day you see a secretary for a detective agency go to the edge of the cocoon looking for a lost boy. It's even rarer to see her comfortable in a firefight. Trina chuckled. Before this, I was just a waitress at my grand's diner. Your grandmother the king sword? The one insane. The carcachu scoffed. What on what would a king sword be doing running a diner? Trina smiled to herself. Why indeed? She remembered as a very young girl having a grandmother and a mother who were both king swords, warriors in the highest guard for the high judge of the city of Ario. The memory was faint, but she could still remember the smell of leather and metal on her mom when she would hug her each day. And one day, it was gone. Her mom was dead, and her grandmother had taken Trina and the rest of her family all the way to Mitror. Trina had never talked about what had happened with Gran. She wasn't sure if it would be too much for the older woman or for her. One day, Trina would know, but for now, she got so good at slicing meat that she decided to become a chef, said Trina with a grin. You should see her handle a knife, a terrifying force of nature my gran is. I'll believe it, grunted Tython, accepting her deflection. Then what's the story behind this boy Caleb? Oh, he vomited on me once, said Trina cheerfully, <laughs> taking a bite of the jerky. And I thought, that right there is a man with class. Tython barked a laugh, his nose quivering. <laughs> Young people and their strange dating habits. It's not much better than what I did. When I was a pup, I tried courting a human girl by slathering myself in mud and howling loudly outside her home. This time, it was Trina's turn to laugh. I imagine that went stupendously. It might have, Tython shrugged. Problem is, her daddy didn't like my singing too much, so he came running out with a double-barreled shotgun in one hand and a <laughs> jar of moonshine in the other. I hightailed it so fast out of there and never spoke to the girl again. <laughs> Trina couldn't help herself. She started cracking up, clutching her side and wheezing as she did so. Oh, kings of buff, that sounds like something Caleb would do. Sounds like your boy ain't the sharpest tooth on the comb. No, Trina admitted, but he's my... Wait, tooth on the comb? Really? Comb teeth are never sharp. They are if you want to brush a carcajou, said Tython gruffly. But really, I think you misunderstood my question to begin with. I wasn't asking how you two came to be, entertaining though that may be. I meant, who is Caleb Mastiff? I fought the kid, and I've never seen a punching bag actually win a fight before, let alone beat me. Ah, that, said Trina, taking another bite of the jerky and clasping her hands behind her head. Caleb's one of those folks who can be difficult to get close to. Oh, I, I don't mean that in a, oh, he's so mysterious sort of way. It's just that he uses his humor to hide his thoughts and guard his feelings. You could ask him the same question a million times, and if he doesn't trust you, you'll get a million different answers. But when he opens up to you, when he lets the real Caleb come through, you realize you've found someone who would do anything for the people he cares about. In the end, he'll go to any length to do what is right, no matter how difficult. Wow, said Tython, staring ahead. That boy has you whipped. Oh, shut the, shut up, said Trina. <laughs> You've got it all backward. I've got him whipped. <laughs> then why don't you do, actually do something about it? You know he desires you and you desire him. Why aren't you courting? Trina frowned. I don't think you could have weirded, said that in a weirder way if you tried. Just answer the question. Trina sighed. It's complicated. Love always is. In my case, it's... Go on. The last boy I loved died in my arms shortly after he tried to kill me. <laughs> okay. All right, then whoever wants to come up next. <laughs> okay, just careful not to bump the cord. <laughs> but otherwise, sit however you'd like or stand. Okay. Um, so this is from my collection of poetry. It is a free verse poem titled Ghost Stories. Oh, and name? Uh, my name is Sydney Fromm. <laughs> <laughs> All ghost stories are tragedies. They tell of loss, 
pain, confusion. We fear the unknown, but how do we not understand that they too fear the unknown? The apparitions of loss and grief manifest into a shadowy figure that haunts the corners of our minds. <laughs> Immortal Game. My name is Talia Rothschild. This is a young adult Greek mythology about a young goddess who is framed for a crime and exiled from Mount Olympus and her quest and story. This is a clip from the middle of the first chapter. Now let the fates choose your opponent. Zeus flicked his hand and one of the decks of fates scattered forward as though blown by the wind. Tumbling through the air, the golden cards spun toward Galene slowing as they approached. Most of the deck came to a stop, hanging in the air like leaves on an invisible tree. Five cards, however, came closer, aligning themselves at Galene's eye level. Choose three, Zeus reminded her. Galene reached up and hesitated. Don't overthink it. She touched two on the left and one beside the far right. They glowed brighter, hanging there until all the other cards drew back, returning to a neat pile on the table. The gold coating on the first card dissolved to, a real, to reveal an image and printed words. It depicted a whale-like sea creature with a gaping mouth lined with rows of long teeth. Body of Cetus, the card read. The card read. Galene swallowed. She had expected one of the cards to be monstrous. At least now she'd gotten the worst out of the way. She turned to the second. Its golden coat, too, disappeared. A giant griffin was emblazoned on it, the fur and feathers shining with gold. Hide of the Grafikin. She blinked in shock. The king of the griffins, eagle, and lion hide was like armor, nearly impenetrable. This card was as bad as the first. Drawing blood would be formidable, let alone killing whatever hybrid creature these cards would create. Turning to the third and final card, Galene sent a silent prayer to the fates. <coughs> Please be something to balance these out. Side of a cyclops or something. The gold disappeared, and she felt the ichor drain from her cheeks. Heads of Scylla. No. Galene looked between them again. She had to have misread them. There had to be a mistake. But no, body of Cetus, height of the Grafikin, heads of Scylla. Each individual card could change any two basic creature qualities into a deadly beast, but all three together? She clenched her fists, digging her nails into her palms. This six-headed monster would be huge, smart, and nearly impossible to wound. I don't know if I can do this. Her legs trembled, and she hoped the Olympians couldn't tell. The cards flew back, presenting themselves to the Twelve. Behind them, gods and goddesses leaned forward to get a, a look at the cards. Shocked murmurs rose, rippling around Galene as the word of her opponent was passed around the stadium. Excitement began to vibrate through the crowd, people realizing that if nothing else, they were about to get a show. There had never been three creatures of this caliber combined for an immortality trial. She looked to her father. His mouth was a thin, pressed line. The other Olympians didn't look at all phased. Some merely sat forward to watch her more closely, disdain in their eyes. The sight lit something inside her. She choked down her fear, forcing herself to stand straighter. Losing isn't an option. The three cards, settling now on the table, began to glow. The fates had given her these cards. They must believe she could do this. I'm strong, powerful, and a good daughter. When I beat this thing, there will be no doubt of my honor despite Cressander's actions. I am worthy of being a deity. Renewed determination surged through her, and she looked out across her element. Under the water before her, a speck of light appeared. Glimmering like a star, it flickered once, then began to grow. As it spread out, shifting and shaping, the light faded to something dark and solid. Several feet below, the sea creature came to life. My name is Eliza Stemmons, and this is my debut, debut novel, As Long As You're Next To Me. It's a historical romance set in 1945, um, just after World War II ends, and is about 
a soldier who comes home from the war and experiences PTSD um, and his best friend who he's in love with but she rejected him and so the situation between them is a little bit awkward and this is a scene um, between them um, and yeah it's from the point of view of Dorothy so the best friend All right. I looked around the park for inspiration my eyes settled on a man walking a large dog I hung to myself and was lost in outlining and shading for a while before I felt satisfied with the page. I looked up again for something new to draw. Nothing really caught my eye until I saw Henry walking toward a bench on the other side of the park. He held a brown paper bag. I knew he was working at the refinery again, which was a short walk away from the park. He must have come here for his lunch break. My first instinct was to run over and sit right next to him, just like I would have when we were younger and things were uncomplicated. The rational and logical side of my brain held me back from doing that. Wouldn't it be better to just stay here and avoid the awkward interaction? I felt horrible for thinking that, so I decided to calmly walk over and say hello to him. Any conversation with Henry would be well worth the awkwardness I might feel. I watched him as I walked. He sat on the bench and put the paper bag next to him. Instead of eating his lunch, he just sat there, looking straight ahead. Hi, Henry, I said as I reached him. I must have surprised him because he flinched. Oh, hi, Dottie, he said. He glanced at me quickly before looking straight ahead again. His voice sounded a bit tired or sad or something, just not like himself. He wasn't even looking at me. He lowered his head into his hands and rubbed his eyes with his palms. Can I sit next to you? He nodded without saying anything. What in the world was wrong with him? I frowned as I sat down next to him. Are you all right? I had to ask. He wasn't like this. At least he never used to be. I'm fine. He said shortly, I just didn't sleep well. I'm sorry, it's not your fault. I was surprised, he was acting so odd. Henry, did something happen? I wanted to put my hand on his arm, but I held myself back. I'm fine, Dot. He looked up at me for the first time. I noticed his eyes were red like he had been crying. If you don't want to talk about it, then that's fine, but I'm going to keep sitting here talking to you. He made a soft sound like he was giving me permission. He continued to stare in front of us. I looked at the same point, trying to figure out if there was something he was staring at. I was almost positive he was glaring at a small patch of grass. I took a deep breath and started talking. Your mom told me you went back to work at the oil refinery. I think that's fantastic. You always really liked it there. You're so talented with math. I can hardly manage my own finances, let alone the finances of a whole company. I paused and looked at him again to see if he would react. He didn't. Well, I think it's well that you're home. I missed you a lot, you know. We all did. I mean... Me and Peggy and Marilyn and Jimmy. I noticed he flinched again when I said Jimmy's name. Strange. We all missed having you here. We need to go to Daisy's again. She bought a new jukebox. It's all nice and shiny, nothing like the old one. It works much better. Henry's gaze moved, moved from the patch of grass to the sky. I took that as a good sign and kept talking. We all need to go dancing again, too. Peggy dragged us out some weekends while you were gone, but it wasn't the same without you. Peggy and I both had to search for partners since Marilyn and Jimmy always wanted to dance with each other. They've been out a few times, you know. Marilyn and Jimmy, I mean. I think they're just so adorable together. I keep telling Jimmy to just go for it and ask her to go steady, but he says he's too chicken. Henry looked right at me. His eyes bore straight into mine as if he wanted to say something, but then he turned away again. He obviously didn't want to talk to me. I can leave if you want me to, I said, feeling a bit frustrated. I know I'm probably being annoying. No, Henry said, almost too quiet for me to hear. What? No, you're not being annoying. Then should I keep talking or should I stop? I'm confused. Um, tell me about your baking. His voice was a little bit stronger now, like he was feeling less tired or sick. I wondered if it was the same problem he was having the other night. He took his lunch out, which was further confirmation that he was feeling better. All right. I began. Well, do you remember when we were kids and I told everyone I wanted to have a bakery? Henry nodded. He was actually looking at me now, which was a good sign. Well, I'm actually saving up to buy the bakery in town. Dottie, that's amazing. Henry grinned. I had really missed his smile. His teeth were a bright white and one side of his mouth went up higher than the other one. I had always loved making him happy so I could see it. I noticed I had been staring at his mouth and I quickly looked at his eyes again, hoping he hadn't noticed. I'm really excited. Mrs. Devon says that she and her husband are looking to retire soon, and they want me to buy the bakery from them. I should have enough money in a few months. Wow, I know. We were both looking at each other and smiling, and it felt right. It felt like we were back in high school, best friends and partners and everything. For a moment, it felt like nothing had changed. 
But then I noticed Henry's eyes were still red and I knew something had changed. He wasn't feeling okay and he wouldn't tell me why. He always used to tell me when something was wrong. He obviously didn't want to today. At least he let me sit here with him and talk his ears off. Thank you. Hi, I'm Daniela Chaminant. This is my book, The Chad Next Door. It's a clean rom-com um, about a woman who gains custody of her niece and nephew and a man who just wants to be left alone. <laughs> My hand slips, catching the handle of the saucepan and knocking it off the stove, sending warm tomato sauce everywhere. All three of us scream out of reflex, probably because Link and Zelda get splashed too, even though the bulk of it hits me in the chest. Thank goodness it wasn't hot yet, but that doesn't make this much better. I stand there, arms dripping with sauce, and my eyes shut tight because I've got a fair bit in my face too. And heaven help me, I'm going to start laughing, even if, if this is so not the time. I really do try to hold it back, but when it breaks from me with a splutter and sends sauce flying out of my nose, I lose all control. Then I slip. That's how a breathless Chad finds me, flat on my back on the massacre that is my kitchen floor and laughing like a maniac. Of course he came running when he heard a scream, and I can only imagine his first thoughts when he sees the red liquid everywhere, because this must look like the most gruesome murder scene in the world. But there I am, laughing my head off because I am such a sad excuse for an adult that the only thing I can do is laugh. He mutters something under his breath as he slips his phone into his pocket, clearly exasperated by my incompetence. Even though I'm still overcome with my laughing fit, I hear him ask if the kids are okay. It's just sauce, Zelda tells him. Is Hope okay? Chad looks down at me and he seems less panicked now that he's taken in the scene. And what do you know, he's just as handsome upside down as he is right side up. Typical. <laughs> I would ask if you need help, he says, but something tells me you'll say you've got it handled. I deserve that and I really could handle it. But I feel like something changed between us last week and he made me feel like I don't have to be the perfect parent when he told me about his sibling. So despite my inner voice telling me that asking for help is not how I operate, I shake my head. Actually, I would love some help. His eyebrows jump up and he doesn't seem to know how to respond to that. But then he holds out his hand and grasps my wrist. And if he has me on my feet only a moment later. Naturally, my foot slips again and knocks me into his chest, which I marginally feel bad about because I just covered him in sauce. The other part of me is thrilled. Thanks, I breathe while I'm still pressed up against him. Gotta get in my fill while I can, since he'll probably freak out again. He's so warm and solid. I want to fall asleep with his broad chest for a pillow and his arms as a blanket and the sound of his heartbeat as a soundtrack to my dreams. Yeah, that sounds nice. Go take a shower, he grunts, gently pushing me away from my little cuddle fantasy. I'll clean up in here. Okay, I know I asked for help, but that's just ridiculous. But go. He points, but it's the strength in his voice that gets me, gets me to move. It's that sense of command that had me so fixated on our first morning here, and I hate how much it works on me now. But at the same time, I don't hate it. I want to salute and say, yes, sir, and maybe do an experiment with his lips, because I can only imagine the way he takes charge with something like a kiss. Hope, Duncan, what in the world is wrong with you? <laughs> I pause at the edge of the hallway and look back to make sure the kids are okay with me leaving them here with Chad, but there is no way I can focus on the kids right now because Chad is pulling off, pulling his sauce-covered Henley over his head, and his t-shirt didn't get the memo that it was supposed to stay put. That t-shirt deserves a medal for failing so miserably at hiding the complete man lurking underneath it. It's not like he's all jagged edges and perfectly cut abs. The abs are there, I promise. He's most definitely strong, but it's the solid kind of strong where you only see the muscles as he moves and shifts and all my stars, he's looking at me. My face goes up in flames because I've been caught staring and probably drooling because for the last six years I've been surrounded by frat boys who think strength comes from 0% body fat so you can see every ab like one big Lego piece pressed onto an otherwise flat stomach. College guys never really did it for me and now I can see why. There's a difference between looking strong and being strong and Chad Briggs is undeniably strong. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a purebred man. <laughs> I'm David Rodeback. This book is Poor As I Am. It's a collection of short fiction, uh, one novella and eight short stories, each of which has something to do with Christmas. I'm going to read the beginning of one of the short stories called The Case of the Missing Hair. 
our parents almost shut down our investigation which parents can do when you're 11 and they don't think it's important <laughs> timmy i know you love the books said dad one sunday at dinner it was after thanksgiving but not super close to christmas so do i but you and jason are not the hardy boys you can't run around investigating anyone you want whenever you think there's a mystery they were a lot older mom said and they could drive they also had a boat as i recall which was true, I knew from my reading, but this investigation didn't need a car or a boat. Also, Dad said, their father, Fenton Hardy, was a licensed detective, so he could help his sons and sort of keep an eye on them. More than that, though, you're sticking your noses into things that are none of your business, and 11-year-olds don't have mature enough judgment to avoid hurting people unnecessarily. I knew what was next. It's not your business why Pastor John is bald, Dad said. <laughs> It was rude and disrespectful of you to ask, especially in front of your Sunday school class. I felt myself turning red. Did he tell you? No, that was your Sunday school teacher. <laughs> Mrs. Brott's superpower was making Sunday school even less fun than actual school, especially for boys. The girls didn't seem to mind so much. I'm curious, Mom said, why did you ask him that? We wanted to know why he's bald when other people have hair. I said, duh, after that, which was a mistake. Dad frowned. Is Jason in this too? We flipped a nickel to see who would ask Pastor John. I should have known, said Dad. For your punishment, you're not allowed to play with him after school this week or on Saturday. You may not use the internet for anything but school assignments. And next Sunday, we're visiting Pastor John, so you can apologize. I wasn't scared of Pastor John, but the rest of it was bad. I didn't complain because they'd just say it wasn't the first time we'd embarrassed our moms and dads during an investigation. And you have to tell us you're sorry, Dad said. I just stared at them. Well, Dad asked. I'm sorry. I hoped he wouldn't ask what I was sorry for because it wasn't for asking Pastor John why he was bald. To be a detective, even when you're a kid, you have to ask people questions without being sorry. I was sorry my parents didn't understand that. I was sorry I was in trouble. If they'd known what we were really investigating, I'd have been in more trouble. I'll stop there. Hi there. My name is Whitney McGruder, and I'm a fantasy author. Today I'm going to be reading chapter one of my most recent release is called The Throwaway Queen. This is a new adult fantasy novel and it's perfect for, well, I wrote this for my friends that have kids of their own and they still are looking for adventure after finding their one true love. So, all right. Chapter one. As much as I have grown to love the green peaks, I was made for a more privileged world. I was made for sparkling waters and a firm sun. I slowed my breath to practice control. The air coursed in and out of my belly as I stretched my limbs and said a prayer of gratitude. I thanked my gods for my body and my spirit. I thanked Abhijita, the goddess of Ushalabi women emulate, that I could still train my body and regain my muscle after bearing Sanjana. I thanked the traveler for the Gavril folk who took pity on me. This was a figure new to me, but without someone's guidance, I could have lost my baby. I usually don't pray to Bhuma, the earth goddess, but I have appreciated her comfort as I have traveled on familiar terrain. Above all, I thanked everyone and anyone I, that I have the strength to finally go home. Before I ended my prayer, I asked for their patience, wisdom, and perspective to help me navigate the moments to come, the decisions, the confrontations, and changes to come. After my prayer, I felt my control over my muscles again and went to work. I ran my usual trail that slithered up the mountainside and raced back down. I approached a straw-stuffed dummy and began my routine of punches and kicks to practice my speed and balance. As my body fell into memorized movements, my heart leaped with joy at the thought of holding both of my babies again. Devraj must be getting so big now. Last night, I had a dream about him. It must have been a memory, but it felt so real. In that dream, he was trying to scramble into my lap even though my pregnant belly took up a lot of room. He still giggled and used a chair next to me to try and wrap his arms around me. A faceless maiden reached out to help him. Back in my reality, I wiped my forehead with my hand and wrapped, 
and wrapped it in frayed cotton and looked down at my belly. I lightly traced my hands over my scars and marks with care. We've been through a lot together, and this act of love was an excuse to catch my breath and stretch. My strength still had its limits. I couldn't wait to see my son's little face. When I could come home, I will never leave. My eyes started to prick with tears. If I think about the past two years, I might lose my endurance and my energy. I went back into my mountain training and left my would-be tears and poorly constricted dummies behind. It was another run or walk up the mountain to a little lake and then back down for me. The slope was a bit steep today, but something guided me down the mountain like a powerful waterfall. We were days away from my kingdom. Soon the Gavril people will see me off and I could put this whole nightmare behind me. It felt like the sooner I got back down the wagon and the goats, the sooner I'd be able to flop back into my comfortable bed or bathtub. I could almost smell my favorite perfumes. Claudio stood waiting for me next to my dummies. He was a head taller than my straw victims and looked down at the lopsided heads with pity. I laughed and waved at him, and his demeanor softened. He carried Sanjana all the way here on his shoulders and merely looked thoughtful as he clung her, to her ankles to support her. Where it came in the village today? More news, he said. What happened? It doesn't sound good, I answered, wiping sweat from my face. Claudia spoke plainly and straightforwardly with me, as Macarian was his third language. King Demir has remarried someone else. He married a Macarian woman. I don't know why we didn't hear of it sooner, but it is old news. I am very sorry. His words tumbled out of his mouth. My mind felt like mush. I wanted to hold Sanjana, my two-year-old baby, born in this wilderness, but I wasn't sure if my arms could carry her. I could barely stand. Demir had just remarried someone else. My hope started to fray. It's not your fault, he said. You are just passing on information. We've been away for so long and worried about the killers. Claudio, I, I can take it. Thank you for telling me, I gritted my teeth. Surely I've been in worse pain than this. No, I take a hundred bursts over the thought. I was only gone for two years. I already felt so much shame that I left my dearest Devraj behind, but that decision probably saved his life. Should I go home? Is there a home for me in Makar? Of course I was going home. Was my son okay? He needed me. The new queen is likely expecting an heir. For Claudio's sake, I just nodded my head and looked at the earth. Claudio and I knew different kinds of pain. He was still grieving the passing of his wife. I was processing a marriage I didn't know I had lost. Your Highness, Claudio insisted, I know that look. What are you going to do now? Will you change your plans? I wiped my face, not sure if I was smearing away tears or sweat. I will still go back, I said. My son is still there. If Demir has remarried, um, surely Makarians aren't as bad as you say, he said. Their customs are strange, but we can get you to the city in a few days. Devraj needs me more than ever, I said determined. I must protect him. I'm his mother. Thank you. Aubrey Barnum. My book is The Birds and the Beasts. It's a poetry collection about mental health, um, tackling themes like anxiety, depression, becoming a, a new mom, um, but there's also poems in here just about family members and stuff like that. It's, it's really a story about myself and my mental health journey. So this one is called Don't Go. You get shorter with age, I notice as you walk to your horses. Your pace is slower and you aren't as strong, but I remember being small and looking up at you with your cattle rides and saddling up. Our family doesn't share much of the heart, there's no time for that. We have chores to do and church to attend. But I want you to know how I don't ever want to forget your, how your voice sounds, how you start laughing at your own stories. And oh Lord, the stories. There are hundreds and sometimes we hear them over and over again, but we never tire of listening. I don't want the day to come where I know you won't be home. The barn will be empty and the garden will be bare. So please don't go, for I haven't heard all of your stories yet. Thank you. Hi, my name is Heather Moore, and this is a historical novel that is based on my 10th great grandmother who was accused of witchcraft in the Salem Witch Trials. I'll read chapter one, it's very short. 
Salem, Massachusetts, 1692, Salem Jail. Veins crisscross the back of my hands like a map of trails, intersecting yet leading to nowhere, much like the path I've worn on the dungeon floor as I pace around the huddled bodies of women, carving footsteps into the cold, hard earth, back and forth and around, back and forth again, stopping at each wall, then passing the row of bars reaching from floor to cragged ceiling. Summer has yet to arrive in full, Though the sound of birds could be heard in the first stretch of morning if I wake early enough and listen carefully above the sighing of female breath and sleep. Rebecca Nurse prays in her sleep, her lips restlessly moving as she talks to our maker. I stop next to her and lean down as she whispers, Lord, preserve our souls, bless our accusers, O Lord. My eyes burn and I straighten as much as my 71-year-old back can move. The years have been harsh to my body, but that harsh Harshness seems like heaven compared to the squalor I live in now. Bearing eight children took its toll, yet I would bear eight more if I could go home again to my George, but I cannot. Thank you. Okay, did we get everyone? Did you want me to read it for you? No? No, not at all? Okay. I'm going to read it one then from someone else who requested me to read. And then that will be the end. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, this is Sarask Forsaken by Mosiah Nielsen. I'm going to read a short clip from it. It is a fantasy novel about a, man, a young man named Trakov Rushcroft who is trying is been hunted by an oppressive regime and he is trying to um, take it down it is a fantasy novel and he has quite extraordinary powers all right it happened again last night isgra i cursed mentally what a stupid move within a short time they'll come looking for me once more forcing me to move on the smell of seasoned pine which i'd grown used to now brought a sad feeling into my heart with it for the first time, I've, for the last time, I folded the sheets of the bed. Once smooth cotton, now rough with age, felt soothing beneath my hands. For once, I'd found someone willing to take in a wanderer like me. In all my years, this was the first time I'd felt accepted and cared for. The kindness of the innkeeper had acted like a shield against the nightmares of the past. Sighing, I pushed away my thoughts and focused on the task at hand, that is, escaping before someone realized who I actually was. In the dread of the moment, I had packed my bag, my bag last night. Now, just before the crack of dawn, the barest whispers of sound were the only signs of my frenzied motions as I grabbed my bag, belted on my knife, and laced up my shoes. There was no need to change my clothes. I always slept dressed to leave in the night. The hazard of having to depart at a moment's notice had always been there, ever since I could remember. I pulled on my black cloak and tucked the hood over my tousled hair. I dashed for the window. The stairs of the inn were very old, and nearly every single one would creak. The chance of even one patron waking was too high, and one is one too many. The latch in the window opened without a squeak, thanks to my regular oiling of the hinges. Without, Though I'd managed to pass off a staff member of the inn for nearly a year, it had become time for me to leave this place. Tugging the hood further down, I reached my arms out into the cold air, gripping the ancient wood of the frame to pull myself out of the window. I stopped as a soft thump of bare feet on wood echoed briefly in my ears. I looked over to my right, my right shoulder to see Winstill, the innkeeper, standing in the doorway. His face shadowed a, shadowed a little with surprise, which transformed into a mixture of kindness, then understanding. He walked slowly to me, offering a brown-wrapped package. I gently took it, the parchment paper crinkling lightly beneath my fingers. He patted my shoulder and gave me a sad smile as I tried to swallow the lump in my throat. Abruptly, the pounding of a fist on the, door, on the front door of the inn interrupted the moment. Pulling on the rough wood of the window frame, I launched myself out into the night. My feet thumped onto the cobblestones of the bordering alleyway, and I could hear more clearly a soldier yelling, Open up! as the banging resumed. Taking a deep breath, I turned and ran the other way, my light footsteps making me a ghost in the night. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, all these books are available on Amazon? Yes? Perfect. Okay.
All the books that were displayed here are available on Amazon, so any that you are interested in, please feel free to look it up, and thank you for watching our video for Indie Author Day readings.